Cannabis Common Sense, the show that tells the truth about marijuana and the politics behind its prohibition. Hello and welcome to another exciting edition of Cannabis Common Sense. We have another good show for you tonight. Uh, standing by in the wings is Mr. John Cornett. Hey, John. Hey, Paul. How you doing? Good to see you. Pretty well, pretty well. And then right next to me is that wild and crazy guy, Mr. Casper Leach. We have some interesting hip news for you tonight. Uh, but uh, before we get to that, let's bring out those infamous dancing cannabis leaves. Feel the force. Out of the Capitol, the United States, members of U.S. Congress this week heard testimony on the state of marijuana research, and leading members of the United States Senate introduced legislation to reclassify CBD. A medical marijuana initiative in Montana qualified for the November ballot, and governors in three states signed marijuana-related bills into law. Uh, on a federal level, on Wednesday, members of the U.S. Senate Judiciary Subcommittee on Crime and Terrorism, chaired by Senator Lindsey Graham of South Carolina, held a hearing titled Researching Marijuana's Potential Medical Benefits and Risks. Testimony was provided by Senators Kristen Gillibrand of New York and Cory Booker of New Jersey, who are the co-sponsors of the CARERS Act, as well as by officials from the National Institute on Drug Abuse, or NIDA, and the Food and Drug Administration, FDA. While several witnesses were asked by the committee whether or not they expected uh, the DEA to reschedule cannabis, none provided a direct answer. Also, today, U.S. Senator Charles Grassley, a Republican from Iowa, Dianne Feinstein of California, Pat Lay of Vermont, and Tom Tillis of North Carolina introduced legislation called the Cannabidiol Research Expansion Act. The act requires the Attorney General of the United States to make a determination as to whether cannabidiol should be reclassified under the Controlled Substances Act and would expand research and potential medical benefits of cannabidiol and other marijuana components. Out in the islands of Hawaii on Tuesday, Governor Dan David Inge signed legislation, Hawaii House Bill 2707, to expand Hawaii's medical marijuana program. The measure expands the pool of practitioners who may legally recommend cannabis therapy to include advanced nurse practitioners. Separate provisions in the bill remove the prohibition on Sunday dispensary sales and on the possession of marijuana-related paraphernalia by qualified patients. Other language in the bill permits the transportation of medical marijuana across islands for the purpose of laboratory testing, but maintains existing prohibitions banning individuals engaging in inter-island travel with their medicine. In uh, the middle of the United States in Missouri, Missouri Governor Jay Nixon signed legislation into law today, Friday, making it easier for those with past marijuana convictions to have their records expunged. The legislative measure expands the number of offenses eligible for expungement from roughly a half dozen to more than 100 nonviolent, non sexual crimes. It also allows people to expunge their records sooner shortening the waiting period to three years for misdemeanors and seven years following a felony offense. However, the law does not take effect until January 2018. In Montana on Wednesday, a statewide initiative to expand and restore the state's medical marijuana program qualified for the November ballot. The initiative is seeking to reverse several amendments to the program that were initially passed by lawmakers in 2011. If approved by voters, I-182 in Montana allows a single treating physician to certify medical marijuana for a patient diagnosed with chronic pain and includes post-traumatic stress disorder, or PTSD, as debilitating conditions for which a physician may certify medical marijuana, among other changes. 
uh, in Pennsylvania on Monday legislation to establish a pilot program to study the growth, cultivation, or marketing of industrial hemp was sent to Governor Wolf for his signature. This measure allows state approved applicants to research and cultivate industrial hemp as part of an authorized pilot program. This proposal is compliant with Section 7606 of the Omnibus Federal Farm Bill authorizing states to sponsor hemp cultivation pilot programs absent federal reclassification of the plant. More than two dozen states have enacted similar legislation permitting licensed hemp cultivation in a manner consistent with that statute. In Rhode Island, Governor Gina Raimondo signed legislation, Rhode Island's House Bill 7142, this week to make post-traumatic stress patients eligible for medical cannabis treatment and to accelerate access to those patients in hospice care. Members of both chambers previously overwhelmingly approved the measure. The uh, new law goes into effect immediately with the governor's signature. Out in Little Rock, Arkansas, Arkansas voters will decide this November on a statewide initiative to authorize uh, and permit physician authorized patients to possess and cultivate cannabis. The Arkansas Secretary of State's office affirmed that the initiative's proponents, Arkansans for Compassionate Care, submitted su sufficient signatures from registered voters to qualify the measure for the November ballot. The 2016 Arkansas Medical Cannabis Act establishes a statewide program for the licensed production, analytic testing, and distribution of medicinal cannabis. Under the program, patients diagnosed by a physician with one of over 50 qualifying conditions may obtain cannabis from one of up to 38 licensed nonprofit care centers. Qualified patients who do not have a center operating in their vicinity will be permitted to obtain a hardship certificate in order to cultivate their own medicine at home. A similar initiative narrowly failed in 2012, garnering over 48% of the vote in Arkansas. Arkansas or voters across the country will also decide this November on statewide medical use measures in Florida and Missouri. Initiatives to permit the adult use of cannabis will be decided in Arizona, California, Maine, Massachusetts, and Nevada. A Michigan initiative remains in litigation. Out of Athens, Georgia, the enactment of statewide medicinal cannabis laws is associated with a quantifiable decline in the use of traditional prescription drugs, according to data published in the July edition of the scientific journal Health Affairs. Investigators at the University of Georgia assessed the relationship between medical marijuana legalization laws and physicians' prescribing patterns in 17 states over a three-year period, from 2010 till 2013. Specifically, researchers assess patients' consumption of and spending on prescription drugs approved under Medicare Part D in nine domains, anxiety, depression, glaucoma, nausea, pain, psychosis, seizures, sleep disorders, and spasticity. The authors uh, reported that prescription drug use fell significantly in seven of the nine domains assessed. The investigators reported generally we found that when medical marijuana laws went into effect, prescribing for FDA-approved prescription drugs under Medicare Part D fell substantially. Ultimately, we estimated that nationally the Medicare program and its enrollers spent around $165 million less in 2013 as a result of the change prescribing behaviors induced by jurisdictions that had legalized medical marijuana. The investigators estimated that prescription drug savings would total more than $468 million annually were cannabis therapy to be accessible in all 50 states. They concluded, quote, our findings and existing clinical literature imply that patients respond to medical marijuana legislation as if there are clinical benefits to the drug, which adds to the growing body of evidence suggesting that the Schedule I status of marijuana is outdated, end quote. The survey data compiled from medical marijuana patients reports that subjects often reduce their use of prescription drug therapies, particularly opioids, when they have legal access to cannabis. According to a 2015 RAND corporate study, opiate-related abuse and mortality is lower in jurisdictions that permit medical cannabis access as compared to those that outlaw the plant. The full text of this study, Medical Marijuana Laws Reduce Prescription Medication Use in Medicare Part D, appears in this month's uh, Health Affairs Journal. And that's the end of our Hemp News segment tonight. Hey, John. Hey, brother, good to see you.
I am so happy to hear all this good news, but you know, I still feel like cannabis is still in prison. I think it needs to be set free. Anyway, I'm here to do some music. I got a song I wrote a little while ago. It goes like this. We like train wrecks or the lights. We like Shrek too. Life is good. Life is good. Oh yeah. Life is good. And me so good, so good, so good, so good. We like God balls, purple haze. We like cheese too. Life is good, oh yeah. Life is good. Life is good for you and me. So good. So good. So good. So good. It don't matter which you like, no matter when you do it, just matters that you do it right and get down to it. So good. So good. We like train wrecks, northern lights. We like Shrek too. What was that other one? Life is good. Life is good. Life is good for you. And me so good, so good, so good, so good. Hawaiian big bud, lemon pledge, strawberry call. <laughs> I can go on. So good. All right. Thank you. thank you, John. How are you doing, Casper? Happy Friday. Hey, thank you, and uh, good to see you viewers out there. Oh, there, on that camera. Okay. Hey, if you have a question for us tonight, you might want to give us a call at 503-288-4442. That's 503-288-4442, and we'll be happy to take your phone calls tonight. Uh, uh, it's been kind of a slow week in cannabis news compared to some weeks. So, uh, uh, and it's still summer, so a lot of people are busy out enjoying the, the last remnants of the, the daylight out there. So how have you been, Casper? Fine, and you're right, it has been slow, but it is exciting to see the number of uh, states that are working through the ballot to make a change. We've always encouraged a revolution in the voter booth, and... Uh, uh, our politicians are also picking up on the fact that marijuana uh, policies and legislations and initiatives uh, get more attention and more political dollars and more political clout than politicians themselves. And uh, I think that's helped uh, the uh, national scene to embrace the uh, new policies as well, maybe even Congress to give it a different viewpoint. You think next year maybe uh, Congress will be dancing 
I ran another couple more bills that might uh, make a change. Could be. Could be. I mean, you know, we've seen a lot of different <coughs> changes, so it's good to finally see a number of them taking place out there after, uh, you know, going through the whole 80s, 90s, 10s before we had any change there. I mean, there was decriminalization in the 70s, uh, about a dozen different states, 10, I think, actually decriminalized marijuana. Then we didn't see anything except moves to ratchet up the drug war until 2012. And so uh, it was a long winter of discontent, in my opinion, for before we saw some changes coming and positively. It's, it's also nice have. to see new jobs and new careers being uh, created in this industry in different states. Like here in Oregon, there's a, uh, a lot of new, uh, I would consider them industry uh, jobs that never existed before. Mm -hmm. And that's true of Colorado and Washington, and I, and I can only see that happening more and more. And in the states where hemp is becoming a farm commodity mm -hmm. in the United States, that is also a benefit. So it is exciting to see it uh, play out on the economic scene. All right, that's true. You know, we are taking your phone calls tonight, so if you have a call about marijuana, you can give us a call at 503-288-4442. That's 503 503- 288-4442 and we do have a caller standing by so welcome to the show caller hi um thanks for taking my call sure um i was wondering uh if they uh if there's any kind of legal uh change in how many like mature and immature plants that they you're allowed to grow now yeah yeah there's no limit on immature plants by immature that's come to mean plants that are not flowering so now you can have an unlimited number of non-flowering plants. And then uh, uh, any adult household over 21, with one residence that's over 21 at least, can have four plants per residency. So that's without any license at all. Then if you have a medical marijuana permit, you can have up to six plants per registered patient. And in the city limits, I think uh, unless you're grandfathered in at double the number, you can have two patients or 12 plants. Well, that so equals out to uh, 12 medical plants and four uh, adult use plants. So that's 16 plants if you have two patients in a household. All right. So just for a recreational grower, um, the, that there's no other specification other than just it has to be flowering? Yeah. Flowering is it. And you can have, uh, like I said, four flowering plants per household. Okay, um, and I have one more question. It's about growing, if that's okay. Go ahead. Um, I have uh, these two plants that I'm growing outside, and uh, both plants are started from seed, and the, both seeds are from the same plant. And a couple weeks ago, I started to force flower one of the plants because I wanted it early by bringing it in early at night and putting yeah. it in the garage. And, and then I put it back outside with the other one every day. And the one that hasn't been... Uh, brought into the garage for the extra darkness seems to be flowering and uh -huh. I was just wondering if you ever heard of that happening like one plant getting forced flowered and it making the other one next to it flower no um, I haven't heard of that huh. but maybe you've uh, got a new thing telepathic plants yeah it seems like uh, I don't know I, I, maybe it was an auto flower brand to begin with or something yeah it could be I'm not sure all right well thanks for taking my call all right you're welcome thanks bye Hey, and we have another caller. Welcome to the show, caller. Yeah, I've been uh, looking at Craigslist, and I noticed there's a lot of marijuana buds for barter, for sale, or trade. Is that legal? No. No. Yeah, that's not legal. Okay, I just work because it's in there all the time. Yeah, that doesn't surprise me. I mean, the police aren't going to enforce that uh, unless there's really a complaint, I think, here in the Portland area. You're talking about in Portland, Oregon, right? Right. Yeah, and the rest of the country that end up with a long jail sentence, but here in Portland, uh, they seem to be getting away with it for now. All right, well, thank you very much. All right, you're welcome. All right, bye. Good night. You know, we, uh, you were talking about hemp for the farm crop a moment ago. We have a little video uh, about hemp fuel. Oh, cool. And uh, we're going to run that video and uh, come back just after that. It's about uh, two and a half minutes. So here it goes. Renewable hemp fuel makes hydraulic fracturing look like mad science. Think about it. 
instead of harvesting superior biodegradable energy from hemp, hydraulic fracturing has countless gallons of toxic chemicals and water pumped into shale to extract gases, doing so much damage to the environment and poisoning people. Gas can be derived from hemp that is biodegradable and good for the earth, harvesting more gas compared to other sources. There's a lot of wasteland good for growing hemp that can help detoxify and regenerate the soil. Maybe people wouldn't be protesting against hydraulic fracturing and contaminated water if hemp fuel was cheap and abundant. Hydraulic fracturing might have not ever developed if hemp fuel was abundant and not a suppressed energy source. Hemp fuel is a superior energy source that doesn't get media attention compared to toxic energy sources renewable hemp fuel can make obsolete. The more abundant hemp fuel becomes, the cheaper transportation will get that makes the cost of living cheaper. The price to produce things would get cheaper, which means more business and a stronger economy where people won't live in fear of collapse. The economy would be stronger if people were able to grow their own superior hemp food and save money. Americans have no idea the University of Connecticut have a study. The hemp biodiesel showed a high efficiency of conversion. 97% of the hemp oil was converted to biodiesel. So people could make their homes energy independent without having to pay bills and grow biodegradable fuel for transportation. Okay, well there's a little video that we found out there. Uh, uh, it's an interesting concept, of course. Uh, uh, Fracturing is definitely causing a lot of environmental changes uh, where it's practiced. So uh, there's one of our solutions, our hemp uh, flame of freedom. This is hemp oil from pressed marijuana seeds with a uh, hemp twine. Uh, here's next week's wick. And uh, it's just a hemp wick and hemp oil and it makes a little lamp here. And so that's actually the oldest uh, uh, illuminant oil was hemp oil. You know, marijuana is the oldest crop. It's been cultivated for at least 12,000 years, maybe over 30,000 years. And it's also the most productive crop. So when we can grow hemp again without regard to its THC, content but with regard to the most productive sources of oil and fiber then our farmers can uh, completely change the energy market. I think it's interesting that when they opened up the uh, uh, pyramids from way back UN and the uh, uh, various cultures going way back thousands of years they have actually found seeds and uh, variety of ways that this plant was used in ancient civilizations that uh, we still are ignorant to. That's true, that's true. You know, marijuana has been, uh, uh, it's the oldest agricultural crop. All agriculture basically sprung from people who first started to cultivate hemp. It was uh, literally thousands of years before other plants were domesticated. So it's uh, uh, pretty neat. But we have another caller out there. Welcome to the show, caller. Oh, not that line. If you have a question for us tonight, you can call us at 503-288-4442. That's 503-288-4442. And we'll be taking uh, phone calls right up to the top of the hour. So you've been working on your hemp radio network? I have been. I've been getting the website all organized, getting ready to release a new newsletter. We're starting to get our uh, content on the MP3s archives back up to date again. So... That's pretty exciting, and we're back to recording uh, new content for the network. So things are back into almost full swing and back up to uh, where they should be at uh, Time for Hemp. And so make it a point to go there and listen to our live stream. We've got about 5,000 people that are listening to it each day now. That's good. And so that rocks, and uh, uh, it's nice to be able to feed that many brains the truth about the need to end prohibition. That's a step in the right direction. So uh, they're, they're listening to the various podcasts? 
They are, and they're listening to the live stream 24-7 now. People are tuning in, and they're staying tuned on. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So I appreciate that. All right. Well, again, if you have a question or comment for us tonight, you can call us at 503-288-4442. That's 503-288-4442. We'll be taking your calls for about another half hour or so here. So uh, feel free to call in. It's been kind of a slow day for uh, action around the cable network. So... Uh, uh, let's see if we can get another video queued up so we uh, uh, can run that. Okay. I do think it's interesting that uh, both candidates are uh, that are running for uh, presidential bid that are in the primaries. You know, it's like weird how they make us focus on the presidential bid. Like that's that's the only thing to talk about. Go but ahead. Both of them seem to be uh, open to the concept of um, medical marijuana being part of our culture and uh, leaving it to the states. So uh, it seems like with uh, no matter who takes the office of the White House, there will be an, a, a better chance of making changes. I hope you're right. I hope you're right. I mean, I think... Uh, you know, a lot of folks in the Republican Party are staunchly against this. So if they regain control, then uh, the, the possibility of uh, uh, further progress seems diminished. But time will tell. So we have another video clip. We're going to run that right now, and we'll be back in just a moment. So enjoy. Here it goes. Tony Button and Duncan Parker have been punting the worth of the hemp plant for years as an all-purpose, entirely eco-friendly material. Now, they're betting the farm on it for housing. You say this is a greenhouse, but it looks the same as any other modern house would. That's exactly the look that we've gone for. We've tried to make it look normal that people can understand. You do not have to live in a teepee out in the eco-village to be sustainable. Just change the resources you use, change the way we work with resources, and we'll go back towards a renewable planet. I guess the obvious giveaway is the roof garden. Exactly. Well, from the outside, that's what we decided to do, shrink the footprint of the house some more by replacing the plant matter that we disturbed and putting it onto the roof. The purpose is both visual and practical, providing a roof that naturally insulates through the winter and protects you from the summer heat. What actually makes this house stand out? This house is actually made out of hemp, which is a cannabis plant, and it's a resource that can provide walls, interiors, everything, and we're showcasing what it can do. Let me show you more inside. It's the sophistication of Tony's home which takes most visitors by surprise. This really looks so modern. What exactly is eco within the house? Pretty much everything you see, and that's the look that we've gone for. We've tried to make it really digestible and looking like a normal house to show people they don't have to look alternative or hippie to be sustainable. Exactly what type of building materials have you decided to use? The house is based on hemp building technologies and that's coming out of Europe and they've rediscovered hemp as a traditional building method. How they do it is they mix the lime with the hemp and there's a bond that takes place between the carbon in the hemp and the calcium in the lime to make cal calcium carbonate which is shell, coral, limestone, really hard substance that is very eco-friendly as well. Inside the other walls, we've also got two layers of hemp insulation. Now this replaces that toxic fiberglass stuff that everyone uses in their roof. It's natural, you can touch it, you can work with it. Because it's a hollow fiber, it's got very good thermal properties as well. Another product that we're using is this, it's hemp chipboard, and this is on the inside of the walls, we've used this as a paneling as well. So literally, 50% of the walls is grown in four to five months on a sustainable, renewable level. And that's very different from our current building practices. So that's the structural stuff. What about the rest of the house? We've got hemp carpets, hemp curtains, hemp lampshades. Over and above that, we've also gone for LED lighting. We've got cork on the floors, which is also a renewable resource. We've recycled ceiling boards on our cupboards. Um, we're just trying to show as many different ways that people can shrink their footprint. If we carry on building houses out of brick and cement, it's not going to be a sustainable future for us. So we have to look at ways of working with nature on a renewable level that we can provide houses that are sustainable, renewable, and also energy efficient. For people, animals, and the environment, hemp is increasingly seen as a healthy, recyclable alternative to petrochemical-based products. The effect of living in an eco-house is also very different to living in a cold, dead brick and, and concrete house. You can feel there is something that is surrounding you that actually does react to your body. If you put your hand on this wall, 
you'll feel it starts heating up in, a, you know, like in about 10 seconds. So it reacts, instead of just carrying on taking energy from your hand, it, this will actually react and it breathes. It's going to absorb moisture, release moisture. So you get a very regulating effect inside. So that obviously helps in warming up and cooling down your house. Exactly. You don't have those extremes anymore. You stay within a much smaller range of temperatures. And that is something that I've really experienced. And everyone who comes to visit me says that as well. They can just feel comfortable in the house. They can just feel that there is a, a good feeling. And I think the house creates a gentle environment. If Tony Button believes that growing hemp, manufacturing and building with it can also create jobs and housing, he's making a great case. All right. Well, that's pretty interesting. They got carpeting, walls, insulation, even the the hempcrete uh, foundation. And it's stylish, which I thought was uh, very important because they point out a lot of people think if you're going to be using renewables, your house is going to look like something that was put together by, uh, oh, I don't know, three teenagers lost on a on a pot party one weekend. Mm -hmm. and, and it's not that at all. It's just very elegant, very beautiful, very nicely done and uh, well very efficient and very executed efficient. that's yeah. for sure i think we have another caller standing by let's see if we can bring that caller in welcome to the show caller hey how you doing boss pretty well how are you i'm doing okay i'm all right how, how's everything in the uh in your world pretty well how, are, how about you uh well i can't complain but uh, i did have a topic that I, I would love to get some feedback from you guys about okay uh, really, uh, to get to the core of it, it's regarding the, the 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 product that's being sold in Portland that's being misrepresented as high quality and or organic, and is fetching astronomical prices, but none of it. And I'm I'm confused as to how that. It seems like it's a pretty um, prevalent thing across the board throughout Portland all of the, the medicine that's being sold at these dispensaries, it's not flushed properly. Mm -hmm. Well, that's a problem with a lot of the growers. They, there's a lot of people out there who really don't know what they're doing. You know, it's the summertime, and so there's always a shortage. So those dispensaries are just getting whatever they can get right now, and I understand that there's not really enough for them to, to meet their, their demand. And that might be part of it. You know, I can't, I won't be an apologist for the dispensaries. I don't have anything to do with them. I grow my own. So, uh, uh, you know, if uh, you're, you're feeding it artificial fertilizers, you better stop that about three weeks before harvest or you're going to have a flower that tastes like artificial fertilizers. And so it's hard to say that's organic when it's not. But, you know, uh, uh, it's up to the, the retailer to make certain that they do some quality testing, and uh, uh, we'll see how that goes. All right. Which really, Portland? Is, which really is the most easy, organic or uh, using all the high-tech chemicals and all the extra I like tips? organic myself. I will say organic is the best. Whether it's easiest, you know, uh, easy is a relative concept. I don't know about easy. Because doesn't it take a few extra steps to be organic to get the same quality of material? No. No? No, not really. No. It's a myth. Um, we have another caller. Welcome to the show, caller. Hello. Hey. Hey, um, I was, I've got two questions. One... I've heard a rumor that it's uh, still dry in several counties in eastern Oregon. Is this true? Yeah, yeah. There's uh, uh, several counties that voted 45% or less in favor of Measure 91 that do not allow uh, medical dispensaries or won't be allowing recreational stores. Wow. That's kind of against what we all voted for, isn't it? It is, it is. However, uh, you know, those uh, counties have uh, lobbied the state uh, legislature to put in an exemption if they got less than 45% of the vote in their county, I believe it was. So I agree. Okay, and is it, is it also true that they will get the revenue from the state tax on marijuana? No. Even though they're not contributing? No, they will not get that revenue. That's okay. written into the law that they can't get the revenue if they don't allow the recreational sales in their area. Nice. And my second question is, 
Recently, the legislature has pulled licenses for a recertification on some medicinal products, such as CBD patches. And I've noticed that they're getting really, really hard to find in dispensaries now. Is there, is there something going on that we don't know about, or do you have any clue? You know, I really don't. I can't answer that with any degree of certainty. I know that uh, they have uh, restricted uh, uh, some of the extractors there for a while. I think they're all back up and running, but I don't really have any direct knowledge about those patches. Like I said, I grow my own, so I don't really go into those stores trying to buy that stuff. I'm so jealous of you. Hey, I wish you everybody could grow their own. Yeah. Thanks, but I don't make patches. Thanks very much, and I appreciate hey, you're welcome. the show. Yeah, I understand. When I first came to Oregon, I kept waiting for th some director of a movie to yell, Cut! Take the plants back to the prop room! Because it just seems so surreal to see all these wonderful plants and all these lovely gardens all over the state and police officers having no concerns about that. And There's really nothing to be concerned about. It's just stores peaceful with, and happy. With, with, with flashing neon marijuana leaves. I mean, you know, it's almost like a dream. I love it. Well, thank goodness for that. We have a studio audience here. If you'd like to come down and join the studio audience, we'll be here most uh, Friday nights at Portland Community Media. You're welcome to join us at 8 o'clock most Friday nights. And somebody's standing by right here on this microphone right now. Go right ahead, John. Yes, sir. I just wanted to express my gratitude for <clears throat> all the efforts that uh, went into Measure 91. and. The fact that I think we still have an OMMP, right? That we is still do. Attack, yeah. right? Okay. Thank goodness. I also heard that there's an XDA that's part of the OLCC that intends to gut the OMMP because he hates uh, the thought that uh, we got what we got. Well, that's a shame. I hope that's not true. Yeah. I haven't heard that. And I also heard that uh, the fight is on and there's a lot of money ready to, to restore 91 to its normal upright position for anyone uh -huh. who's interested in joining that effort. How do so, they reach out to that? Do you have any uh, Well, uh, they can call a fellow named Greg. Uh, I will give him his number. I'll give whoever wants their number. If they call the studio here, and I'll, I'll get their number and, and get them in touch. Okay. But, uh, they're going to take this all the way, so for anybody who wants to know. All right. Thanks. And we have another caller on the line. Welcome to the show, caller. Hi. Yes. I just want to say thank you to my cousin, Carlick, for letting me know about your show first. All right. My question... My question for you guys is, how long do you think and what is the best way for the rest of the country to come up to the Oregon standard? And also, what is your best advice for someone who lives out of state and that can help the legalization effort? Okay, so taking that first part of the question, uh, how does the rest of the country, you know, we've just got to lobby and educate. And that answers both parts of your question. It's really a fact that People are becoming educated about cannabis. You know, this show's been on the air here in Portland for 20 years. And when it first came on 20 years ago, and as recently as uh, five or 10 years ago, people couldn't believe that we were on the air talking about marijuana. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, and so it just comes down to breaking that stigma, coming out of the closet and telling the Being truth able to about step up marijuana. And just talk about it, really, without shame. Yeah, exactly. It's something to be proud of, not to be ashamed of. And it's weird, too, because when you finally do experience marijuana, it is not as abusive. To, I mean, when I first got drunk, I was sick the next day and hung over. When I overdosed on sugar, I, was, I had nap attacks and headaches. But marijuana, it's a nice feeling. There's nothing really negative to it. You do live longer, and it's a great product. And when you realize the horrible lies that have been put around it, it's just astounding. Mm -hmm. Really, it's astounding uh, th that uh, uh, when people encounter the truth, how their, uh, l their, their ability to grasp reality doesn't put their mind to a, a better set. It's like that well, old I wanna, ceiling. I want to thank you guys for answering my phone call and helping that out. I appreciate it. Thank you. Hey, you're welcome. Good luck out there. Thank you. Have a good day. You know, it's, it's the, the fact the truth will set you free, especially when it comes to marijuana. You know, there's been so many lies about this all these years. You know, at first uh, they made it illegal because they said it'll make you go crazy and kill your family and friends. Next they said it made you lazy and apathetic. Next they said it'll cause you to get hooked to heroin. Well, it doesn't do any of those things. In fact, it's just the opposite. 
And so it doesn't uh, make you kill your family and friends. It promotes peace and love. It doesn't make you lazy and apathetic. It motivates you and gets you going. It doesn't cause you to get hooked to heroin. It helps people get off those opioids. And so these are all just lies that have been put out there to benefit a few people economically. Primarily, it's been the petrochemical, pharmaceutical, military, industrial, transnational, corporate, elite, crony capitalist ruling class that have pretty Sons much given. Sons of bitches. No, no, crony capitalist ah. ruling class. And so that's the one I chose this time. So uh, those are uh, the people who, who made up the lies about marijuana. They even used a, a racist term uh, from uh, Mexico. And if they tried to make hemp illegal, it never would have happened. Mm -hmm. Instead, they've taken what's the oldest crop crop that's been cultivated over 12,000 years and the most productive crop and said it was a deadly new drug and that's how they made it illegal and that was wrong. And again, I can't reiterate, when I first got sick on liquor, I said, oh, this makes sense why you should be a certain age and not drink it and the uh, same thing with the variety. But when I touched marijuana, so I could never find anything wrong with it ever. And my uh, number of years of using it, all I've ever, and then study after study has been proving uh, all of this correct that you know, it's good for Alzheimer's, it's helpful with uh, dietary problems, it's helpful with all kinds of other medical problems that a person has to deal with, not to mention just using it on a regular basis helps to keep you uh, healthy, just mm -hmm. uh, uh, ward off future problems that a person might have if they didn't use, you know, like hemp oil as part of their diet. That's true. It's. Uh uh, you know, I found it hard to believe when I first heard someone say that marijuana makes you live longer. But in fact, there's recent evidence to show that that's true. So uh, uh, it's just been a bunch of lies. And, you know, here we still have the government saying it's a Schedule One drug with no medical use. Uh, the DEA or Drug Enforcement Administration says that. On the other hand, the Health and Human Services Division patented it about 10 years ago to fight cancer and help chronic pain patients. So uh, there are these contradictory impulses from our federal government. Uh, and that's the real hang up on an international level is the United States and our federal government. We're the ones who implemented marijuana prohibition and it'll take us the people to stop it. So uh, here in Oregon, we have uh, legislators at the f in the federal government that are trying to do that, but we need to get all of them to. And so that will be a big step forward when it can happen. Well, let's see if we can queue up another video. If you have a call out there, you can call us at 503-288-4442. That's 503-288-4442. We'll be taking your calls right up to the top of the hour. And so... Uh, um, I'm not going to get out a little song and dance routine here. What do you want to talk about, Casper? Well, we might talk about the hemp stock that's going to be coming up this uh, year. Yeah, that we have, have that coming up on uh, September 24th and 25th. That's Saturday and Sunday, September 24th and 25th, right here in Portland, Oregon, the Portland Hemp Stock Festival. If you're up in Seattle, the largest... Uh, Marijuana Protestable it goes on. That's the uh, Seattle Hemp Fest. Uh, that's down at Myrtle Edwards Waterfront Park, right below the Space Needle. It's in a little strip of a park along the Puget Sound. It's about a mile and a half long. And uh, you can find out more about it by going to hempfest.org. This year it is August 19th, 20th, and 21st. That's August 19th, 20th, and 21st. I am going to be going the weekend before that down to Mexico City. So I'll be making some presentations about the history of hemp and marijuana and medical marijuana before a group known as Expo Weed in the World oh, Trade cool. Center. So I'll be uh, taking my first trip down to Mexico City and uh, spending uh, about a week down there. And uh, that is Expo Weed. You can find out more about that by going to Expo Weed Mexico. Dot com. That's expoweedmexico.com. And uh, I don't speak Spanish, but there will be translations provided. I understand. Now you behave yourself and don't get yourself arrested in Mexico. You know, Mexico. We can't help you if that happens. Mexico has pretty lenient marijuana laws. But you've seen that commercial, right? I have. All right. Have. So just as long as. 
right? Not me. Okay. Far be it for me from doing that. Okay. Uh, let's see. Did the studio get another video ready? I guess not. So you've got, tell us more about Time for Hemp. Time for Hemp is a growing group of people who are dedicated to ending prohibition, and we are focused on expanding that knowledge base to everybody who's willing to tune in and listen. You can find us at Tumblr, SoundCloud, iTunes, and of course, iHeartRadio. We are the only 24-hour a day, seven day a week, all cannabis, all the time broadcasting network, not only on the internet, but also on iHeartRadio. Radio. You can get uh, cartoons there that you can share with your friends, and uh, you can find all kinds of free MP3s that you can download and pass around. And the idea is to let people know about turning this wonderful plant into paper, fiber, fuel, and medications, and about making it possible for those who need to utilize this for medication to stop being considered a criminal. So if you like the idea of this plant being part of our commodity and part of our world and part of our medicine cabinet make it a point to go to timeforhemp.com tune in and don't forget it's like a good joint it's always best when you share us with your friends thank you paul for that shameless plug hey you like doing those shameless plugs and who am i to complain about that here i'm texting to the control room trying to find if they can get a video on there but apparently i haven't been able to find one how about hemp for victory hemp for victory uh, Groovy. How about, uh, you got a call out there? You can call us at 503-288-4442. Well, don't forget, if you get a chance to adopt a, a member of Homeland Security, because they're going to be losing their jobs here, they're not going to be uh, in such demand when uh, people are no longer being arrested for the utilization of, of cannabis, and it's going to be sad in their little worlds. So you might make it a point to adopt them, make them a, pay, a pen pal, send them emails, pictures, invite them over for the holidays. So we have about 10 minutes left, and here's the video. We'll be back in just a moment. Long ago, when these ancient Grecian temples were new, hemp was already old in the service of mankind. For thousands of years, even then, this plant had been grown for cordage and coarse cloth in China and elsewhere in the East. For centuries prior to about 1850, all the ships that sailed the Western Seas were rigged with hemp and rope and sails. For the sailor, no less than the hangman, hemp was indispensable. A 44-gun frigate, like our cherished old Ironsides, took over 60 tons of hemp for rigging. Including an anchor cable 25 inches in circumference. The Conestoga wagons and prairie schooners of pioneer days were covered with hemp and canvas. Indeed, the very word canvas comes from the Arabic word for hemp. In those days, hemp was an important crop in Kentucky and Missouri. Then came cheaper imported fibers for cordage, like jute, sisal, and manila hemp, and the culture of hemp in America declined. But now, with Philippine and East Indian sources of hemp in the hands of the Japanese, and shipment of jute from India curtailed, American hemp must meet the needs of our army and navy as well as of our industries. In 1942, patriotic farmers at the government's request planted 36,000 acres of seed hemp, an increase of several thousand percent. The goal for 1943 is 50,000 acres of seed hemp. In Kentucky, much of the seed hemp acreage is on river bottom land such as this, along the Kentucky River Gorge. Some of these fields are inaccessible except by boat. Thus, plans are afoot for a great expansion of the hemp industry as a part of the war program. This film is designed to tell farmers how to handle this ancient crop, 
now little known outside Kentucky and Wisconsin. This is hemp seed. Be careful how you use it. For to grow hemp legally, you must have a federal registration and tax stamp. This is provided for in your contract. Ask your AAA committee man or your county agent about it. Don't forget, hemp demands a rich, well-drained soil such as is found here in the bluegrass region of Kentucky or in central Wisconsin. It must be loose and rich in organic matter. Poor soils won't do. Soil that will grow good corn will usually grow hemp. Hemp is not hard on the soil. In Kentucky, it has been grown for several years on the same ground, though this practice is not recommended. A dense and shady crop, hemp tends to choke out weeds. Here's a Canada thistle that couldn't stand the competition. Dead as a dodo. Thus, hemp leaves the ground in good condition for the following crop. For fiber, hemp should be sown five pecks to the acre. With drill, the closer the rows, the better. These rows are spaced about four inches. This hemp has been broadcast. Either way, it should be sown thick enough to grow a slender stalk. Here's an ideal stand. The right height to be harvested easily, thick enough to grow slender stalks that are easy to cut and process. Stalks like these here on the left, they yield the most fiber and the best. Those on the right are too coarse and woody. For seed, hemp is planted in hills like corn, sometimes by hand. Hemp is a dioecious plant. The female flower is inconspicuous, but the male flower is easily spotted. In seed production, after the pollen has been shed, these male plants are cut out. These are the seeds on a female plant. Hemp for fiber is ready to harvest when the pollen is shedding and the leaves are falling. In Kentucky, hemp harvest comes in August. Here, the old standby has been the self-rake reaper, which has been used for a generation or more. Hemp grows so luxuriantly in Kentucky that harvesting is sometimes difficult, which may account for the popularity of the self-rake with its lateral stroke. A modified rice binder has been used to some extent. This machine works well in average hemp. Recently, the improved hemp harvester, used for many years in Wisconsin, has been introduced in Kentucky. This machine spreads the hemp in a continuous swath. It is a far cry from this fast and efficient modern harvester to the Armstrong model of yore. But here's one kind of harvester, at least, that doesn't stall in the heaviest hemp. In Kentucky, hand cutting is practiced in opening fields for the machines. All right, that's an excerpt from the 1943 United States Department of Agriculture video, Hemp for Victory. It's pretty, uh, pretty interesting, and now there are different uh, harvesting methods and newer machinery. So now, I'm pretty... confused. That was put out in 1943, yet our government has been insisting since then that they knew nothing about hemp, they knew nothing about growing it, they knew nothing about producing it, and all the things that it could make. Well, here we are then. Obviously, this, this video proves that was a lie. It was our friend, Jack Kerr, who searched through uh, Library of Congress and found a, a reel of this hidden away in a, an archive box and, and made it public. So we can thank uh, Jack Kerr, the author of The Emperor Wears No Clothes. Uh, interesting book on the history of hemp. Listen, we're out of time. All right. Thanks, Casper. Thank you, viewers. We're going to let John Cornette play another cool song. We'll be back next week. And remember to help us. Restore hemp.
she will brave the fight. She's my Joan of Arc, reaches through the flames, says, Come to me, I can heal your pain. She's my Mary Jane. She's my Mary Jane, she's my Mary Jane, she's my Mary Jane.